morning. Thanks so much for having me this morning. Um, so yeah, I was looking forward to like the whole weekend. I was so excited about today. <laughs> so yeah, thanks. Thank you. I will just start sharing my screen. And yeah, thanks for turning on your webcams. It's really nice to see everyone. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking how should I how should I go about um sharing about today? And I figured um this journey of um being Okay, this, this journey of shark conservation has been pretty interesting for me in the sense that I think I, I learned so much and I gained a lot of insight and it became something that has shaped me in a sense. I was just talking to Dawn earlier and, and yeah, the, the, and she was saying how the journey shapes us and I was thinking, yeah, indeed the journey has shaped me. And um, yeah, I just, I guess I just want to share the journey more than anything else and you, I'm, I may end up having sharing a lot more of my questions than anything else because I guess the more I learn, the more I realize I, I don't know. And I, I just want to be honest about that too. Yeah, but I guess the love for uh, sharks has remained, uh, if not deeper. And I, yeah, hopefully as you travel through this journey with me in the next 20 to 30 minutes, I, you can see a little bit of what I've seen and the struggles that I have um, experienced as well. Okay, so maybe I'll start with um, a picture of one of my favorite sharks. I am quite sure all of you would know what this shark is. And feel free to unmute yourself and speak. It's, it's good to hear other sounds as well. <laughs> yeah, anyone has any idea what this shark is? Okay, maybe everyone's still a little bit polite. Okay, I'm sure you all know this is a whale shark. So I, it's, I didn't take this picture. Um, so I had to find a picture of the internet. I'm sorry about that. But um, I wanted to start with this story about um, a whale shark encounter that I had back in 2011 that kind of shaped a lot of the things that I did, that I have been doing since then. So in 2011, my brother actually reached out to me. My brother lives in Australia. So he reached out to me and he said, hey, do you want to go to Exmouth in uh, Western Australia? Because you can see a lot of whale sharks there. So I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, sure. I would love to do that. And then we went together and then we were out in the Indian Ocean. And just being able to see the whale shark um, in the middle of nowhere, like right in the middle of the Indian Ocean where you can see no shore at all, was just one of the most amazing experiences I've had. And I guess uh, I remember the moment I jumped into the water and I saw the whale shark. It was just a juvenile whale shark, maybe only about six meters or so long. And the moment I saw it, I just started crying. <laughs> it was just so uncontrollable. The, the tears just came. And I, and I, yeah, I, I guess from that point on, I just started thinking about all the things that people said about sharks. And a lot of the views that people had about sharks seemed to come from, um, seemed to come from a place of having watched Jaws. And that was their only, that was the only um, idea people had about sharks. Sorry about the planes flying back, but I hope it doesn't disrupt too much. Yeah, like people were saying that, oh, sharks are scary. You know, there are only great white sharks around. They kill people, they eat people. But the moment I saw the whale shark and how gracefully it was swimming around, I was like, hey, you know, people just don't have enough experiences with the different types of sharks. There isn't just one species of sharks. There's like more than 500 over different species of sharks. Yet people only shape their, their impression of shark based on that one species. And even then, that one species is not, is not evil in any sense, so to speak. It doesn't, it doesn't like jump out of the water to hunt humans for one. So it's quite, um, it was quite, it was quite of a dissonance for me in terms of like what, what people were talking about sharks and what I was experiencing with sharks. So another encounter I had was uh, with a thresher shark. And this was, uh, I can't remember which year this was. I think it was 2013, I might be wrong. Yeah, so this is a thresher shark that we saw when we were diving in Malapasqua, me and my friends. Yeah, in fact, these friends uh, that I'm talking about, uh, Siulian here would know them too. <laughs> yeah, so we were diving in Malapasqua and then we we had to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning just to be able to see the pressure shark um, swimming. And this is a very particular spot for them to, to come up to. And they'll just circle around because um, there are certain, it's a symbiotic relationship they have with um, certain, uh, certain species of cleaner rest. It's a type of fish that helps to eat the parasites of the pressure shark. Although I think help may not be the word. Like I said, it's a symbiotic relationship. So it feeds the rest and the pressure shark gets clean as well. I saw a raised hand. Does anybody want to say something? Just go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Adam. Uh, what is a symbiotic relationship? 
Oh, oh, great. Thanks for that question. Symbiotic relationship is a, it's a relationship between two, two creatures in wildlife and biodiversity whereby um, they help each other. So the things that they, they do certain things for the other, uh, a, certain, a certain species does something for another species to kind of, to seemingly uh, help the other species. But actually, whatever this one species is doing for the other species is also helping the species, um, like it's, they're helping each other out. So for example, with um, the thresher sharks, thresher sharks will swim around this area and the cleaner rest fish will come along and they will start to eat the parasites of the thresher shark. So it seems as if the cleaner rest is helping the thresher shark, but actually the thresher shark is also helping the cleaner rest because they are feeding the, the cleaner rest. It gives them an easy way to find food. They just have to eat it off the thresher shark. So that's an example of a symbiotic relationship where two species do things that can help each other mutually. I hope that answers your question and I'm so sorry I didn't make it clearer. So um, I guess with all those experiences I had with sharks, I got really, really curious, more and more curious about sharks. And I, I so there was one day where I saw a Facebook post where people were um, posting pictures of uh, sharks being landed and caught in Lombok, Indonesia. And a lot of uh, very negative comments were made. Some people were saying things like, oh, these fishermen are so cruel. They're so evil. Why are they killing the sharks? Blah, blah, blah. And I got really curious. Like I, I figured it, it felt as if um, people were posting pictures and people were making comments, but I didn't know what the fishermen were thinking or feeling or what would they have to say about this? Or did they even know that the pictures were being posted? So I got curious. I flew to Lombok. I found the fish market where the pictures were taken. And I started talking to the fishermen. And I started to see another side of the whole issue. Like people kept on talking about shark fishermen are evil and horrible and they kill sharks. But as I talked to the fishermen, I also learned another perspective that these fishermen didn't intentionally choose to want to harm or kill a shark. They just happened to live by the coast. They just grew up as fishermen. Um, their parents taught them how to use the boats and fishing gear. And of course, that's that's the thing that they grew up with. It's 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 a it's a it's the things that they were exposed to and the experiences that they had growing up that led them to do what they did. And of course, they have to feed their families. And if the opportunity ar arose for them to be able to um, provide for their families by catching sharks, why not? So as I learn more and more about um, their livelihood, I also learn about the difficulties that they have hunting for sharks. Some of the things that they shared with me was that they had to be away from their family for many, many weeks and sometimes months because over time they also, sh also shared that they had to go further and further away in order to be able to hunt for sharks it got more and more difficult i guess that was uh, a sign that that we are really depleting the oceans of sharks because they it was harder for them to be able to find and catch the sharks so as i spoke to them and i learned all these things i also learned one more thing from the fishermen and that was that um, just off the coast where they they live there are actually a lot of very good sites for snorkeling and as they shared this with me, I was thinking, hey, why don't we do something together? I will bring um, tourists uh, over to Lombok and then you can take them out on the boat snorkeling so that you can, uh, they can enjoy these nice sites that you, that you say, um, that, that, you, that you speak of. And then we can pay them, you know, we can pay them more money uh, for, snor for, for taking people on snorkeling trips rather than hunting for sharks. So that was how the dorsal effect started. Basically, I started this together with the fishermen. We started this uh, ecotourism business to get to get people to see that hey, maybe if you come on a trip with us, you can also be part of um, so called the solution. I'm putting air quotes because I'll talk more about the complexity of all these things that I've been struggling with as well later. So of course, at the start, I was really excited. I was like, oh, yay, I start a business by myself and all I get to do is to swim in the ocean, which I love so much and get to do what I love to do. Of course, it, that's not all I had to do with the dorsal effect. Running a business is not easy. I had to manage a lot of things. I had to market. I had to, I had to arrange for trips. I had to do the finances. I had to yeah, basically do everything by myself. Lah. And I very quickly realized that I didn't just get to do the things I love. Of course, I still get to go into the ocean a lot, which I, I loved. But yeah, it wasn't just that. But it's okay. I guess I learned along the way how difficult it can be trying to start something on my own. Uh, I'll share with you one particular story um, on one of the trips that I took um, some tourists on. 
So basically, when we went to the fish market, we actually depart from the fish market itself on the boats. So at the fish market, one day, we saw these two coral cat sharks that were actually sold um, yeah, at the market. So when I saw the coral cat sharks, I was like, whoa, okay. Uh, this wasn't the main uh, shark market. I'll show you pictures of the main shark market later, but this is just the fish market beside the shark landing spots where I saw these coral cat sharks. And the interesting thing about coral cat sharks is they can live out of the water for up to 14 hours and they still can breathe. So that's something very amazing about them. Um, but when, so, so when I saw the fish, these, these two coral cat sharks being sold, I could see that they were still breathing. So the group of us decided to buy the coral cat sharks and release them at one of the snorkel sites that we were going to. I don't think that was the best idea, but at that point in time, all we wanted to do was to, you know, just be able to see the coral cat sharks get to live because they were still breathing after all. So we successfully managed to get one of the, to, to kind of like rescue one of the coral cat sharks and I'll show you a video of it swimming away, but the other one didn't make it. Yeah, so this is one of the snorkel sites that we went to. A bit shallower and we started to release him. There'll be a close-up later. You can see that there are hook marks on the side of his, um, near, near where his gills are. can see at this point. Yeah, can you see the little hole? Yeah, that's the hook mark he's hurt his injury. Oops, sorry, yeah. So I'm sharing that video because, um, oh, sorry, this is not the best. Okay, yeah, I, I shared this video because as you can see, uh, it was really exciting for the whole group to be able to have seen that, that coral cat shark on the tray being sold as food soon. And then after that, get to see it swimming away. So while it was exciting, at the same time, I said earlier that I, I don't know if that was the best decision as well, because the thing is we didn't, we don't know where the coral cat sharks were caught specifically. So we may have released it in a spot where it didn't come from. And we don't know if um, this coral cat shark that survived where we release it to will actually disrupt the ecosystem that we release it to. So I don't have enough scientific information to know about what was happening in the spot that we were releasing him at. Uh, and that's why I don't know if it's the best solution, but at that point in time, that was the best we could do given what we had. And um, I guess because he's quite small and he may not eat that many things, hopefully he wouldn't be that disruptive to the ecosystems. Plus he may just want to swim somewhere else, which is a lot, a lot more suitable for him. So yeah, just some thoughts. Okay, so uh, sorry if all these images are a little bit disturbing, but this is basically the shark market, beside the fish market that I was talking about earlier. So they, they do land a lot of different species of sharks, such as the silky sharks, the dusky sharks, um, even the wedge fishes, as you can see here, the flat, the flat headed ones. And um, yeah, basically, um, I it is a very big trade. So it is not easy to get all the fishermen to be converted to be able to take people on snorkeling trips. So this trade is kind of still going on. But um, I guess as I bring students on this trip with me, I also try to show them that, hey, this is the situation that's happening. I can't say that we can convert all the fishermen just by getting them to, to, take, to, to, to be, to be ecotourists, uh, boat trippers, uh, to take people on, on, on snorkeling trips. But uh, maybe you can talk to this fisherman and find out a little bit more about how complex this whole situation is. So I, get, I guess the good thing is there's this uh, Wildlife Conservation Society group that has been going to the fish market every single day for many years now to collect the data of the sharks that they see at the ports. So they, they take information like um, they would take a lot of, uh, like they would find out whether it's male or female, what species is it, what is the length of it, was it pregnant or not, where was it caught, what boat was used to catch it. And with all this information, the good thing is Wildlife Conservation Society actually works alongside the Indonesian government to propose uh, policy changes to, to decide whether certain types of uh, sharks should be caught or should not be caught, 
or should they only be uh, caught whole or not and things like that. Yeah, so just a little bit of an interesting fact about the, I don't know if you all use WhatsApp. <laughs> I, I guess quite a number of people use WhatsApp. So WhatsApp has this emoticon of a shark, right? Which is really cute. But um, yeah, I just want to point out that it's a little bit anatomically wrong because it only has three gill slits and sharks typically have about five to seven gill slits. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we should write into WhatsApp to ask them to add a few more slashes. <laughs> Okay, so coming back to what uh, I do a dorsal effect. When I bring students on the trip, I also get them to sit down and talk to the shark fisherman. So this is a Suhadi, the one in the red brush guard. He used to be a shark fisherman and uh, he lives in, in yeah, he, bas he basically lives by the, by the coast. And uh, I get the students to talk to him about, uh, to find out more about what shark fishing, what, what life as a shark hunter was like. What were some of the difficulties he faced? What does he like about ecotourism? What does he think? Uh, um, what, what does he do for his family? What are his needs and things like that? So as the students talk to the fishermen, they get to see the other side of the story as well and not just talk about how we should stop eating sharks. Like we, they get to see that, hey, there is a lot more to this. There are a lot more stakeholders. There's the fishermen. There's also the, the merchants. There are the, the governments. There's a wildlife conservation society that's also trying to do something that's beneficial for everyone else. Okay, so to segue a little bit, um, in 2018, I had a chance to go to Florida um, to get to work with a few shark scientists and find out what and find out more about the work that they do. So this video might look a little bit disturbing, but uh, don't worry, the shark is okay at the end of it. Basically, what is happening here? So before you watch the video, I'll tell you what's happening. These two uh, people in the video are actually shark scientists. So they're actually doing a lot of research on sharks that can be found uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And with all the data that they collect on their trips out on the boat, they can work together with the government to also um, make changes to policy if needed for certain species of sharks. Whether should you control um, the catch of certain species of sharks, should you control, should you limit the size of the shark before you are able to catch it and things like that. Basically, um, conservation efforts that work alongside policy work. Okay, so this was a hammerhead shark that we saw on the boat trip. And um, yeah, so uh, the scientists have already tagged him, took a little bit of his sem of um, his uh, fin sample to, to take back to the lab before they release him back into the water. Okay, I don't know if you heard at the end, the, the, the scientist actually said he's fine. Yeah, he looked a little bit disoriented as he was thrown back into the water. But and that's the thing about hammerhead sharks. It's one of the more vulnerable species that you shouldn't take out of the water. But because it happened to be on the line already, they had to quickly take the data and quickly release him as soon as possible so that he has a higher chance of surviving. Okay, so what we did on the boat uh, with the shark scientists was that we would put out a long line. So this is called a, sh a shallow water long line survey method of um, surveying sharks in the Gulf of Mexico. So we would put baits on this long line. So a lot of mackerel and fish on the long line, and then we'll lay it out on the ocean. And then after that, <clears throat> we'll quickly circle back and pull the line up to see what is caught on the line. And so my, my work um, when I was on this boat trip was I was writing, I was collecting the data of whatever was found on the line itself. So as you can see, um, the species here don't make sense to you because they're all uh, scientific short forms that the scientists use. So like the RTER actually refers to the Atlantic, um, Atlantic shark nose shark. As you can see, it was mostly that species of sharks that we saw in this area of the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, so we would collect data like the sex, what was the length of it, uh, what, uh, what was the weight of it. Uh, we would put a number tag on it. Uh, how big was the hook that it was caught on? Were there any extra things that we saw on it? Yeah. So these are the number tags that after we, we get the shark out of the water and we measure it, we would start number tagging the, shark, the, the, the sharks. And these number tags basically um, kind of help the, fish, the, the scientists to get more information about the shark. If let's say the shark gets caught later somewhere else, and then the fisherman sees the number tag, they can contact the shark scientist again and tell them that, hey, I saw your tag. Um, this is a photo of the shark that I caught. 
uh, this is uh, where I caught it and what I saw about it so that the scientists can find out more information about where it travels to, where are the, tra where are the places where it's likely going to be caught at and things like that so that it can inform policy decisions. Yeah, so this is how we measure the shark basically before we put it back in the water. So I know it looks a little bit disturbing because the sharks are like out of the water and then like when they were caught on the line, um, of course the hook would, would injure them as well. But at the same time, sharks are pretty hardy so they can survive quite a, a lot of things. And that's why the scientists try to work as fast as possible. After they've collected all the data they need, they quickly put the shark back into the ocean again. Okay, so when I was in Florida, I also got to see a lot of specimen of uh, dead sharks in the museum. And it was really awesome because I got to see this frill shark as well. I don't know if you are familiar with the frill, frill shark. Uh, it's, it's small, it looks like an eel, it's pretty long. But when I saw the teeth, it was just amazing how many layers of teeth it has. Okay, so a little bit of the work that I do in Singapore as well. So because I of the work that I did in Lombok and after my experience in Florida, um, uh, as you can see in this picture, there's this lady here. Her name is Naomi Clark Shen. She's a really awesome shark scientist in Singapore. I can introduce you to her. Yeah, basically, uh, she and I have been going to the fishing ports in Singapore to find out about the sharks and rays that we see um, imported in Singapore, uh, in Singapore's fishing ports too. So we've been doing a lot of work here as well. <clears throat> and one of the things that we found was uh, a wedge, uh, okay, not a wedge fish, but wedge fishes are also a type of so-called shark. They look like sharks, a mixture between a shark and a ray. So they're actually very sought after for their fins too. So during one of the trips to the fish market, we actually managed to find a species that was, that was thought to be extinct for the last 20 years. And it got published as a paper in 2018. Yeah, so these are some of the interesting things that we see at the fishing ports. And, I, and I'm sharing this because I think science can be, science research is very important. Uh, much as uh, advocacy and activism and campaigns are important, I also feel that science is a very big part of conservation as well because you never know. There's so much that we don't know about different species of sharks and rays that we need to find out about. Yeah, I'll skip this slide uh, and, and uh, yeah, and I'll talk about um, this. So when I first started on my shark conservation journey, so to speak, um, while I was still a teacher, I found out about shark savers and I, I, I offered to like, uh, I, I volunteered with them for a while and I offered to do like uh, talks about sharks to, to children. And these were some of the slides that we used. But I wanted to highlight this point that science is not always right because one of the things that we talk about with the shark saver slides back in, as you can see here on the slide 2010, this was about 12 years ago, um, basically, we gave this case study in the talk that when you eliminate um, the mid-Atlantic uh, shark, they will start to, the cow nose rays will start to, because the, the mid-Atlantic sharks eat the cow nose rays, cow nose rays eat the scallops. Okay, if we were to kill, if we were to hunt all the, all the mid-Atlantic sharks, there'll be too many cow nose rays. And when there's too many cow nose rays, they will start to eat up the scallop population. And this would affect the scallop uh, farmers, the fish, fish, the, the scallop fishermen. Okay, so this was something that we did, or, or rather, we talked about when we were giving shark savers talks. But when I went to Florida and I met with, um, I met with this other shark scientist, Dean Grubbs. He actually shared with me that because of this scientific paper that said um about this uh about what the effect of uh, hunting sharks uh, affecting cow nose rays and scallops. He said that a lot of these fishermen started to go out to hunt the cow nose rays. Okay. And then these cow nose rays started to be hunted to a point where they were overfished. So it was really sad. And that's why new science was done. And he did this research talking about how the previous paper was actually wrong. It, it, he, so he says that uh, in this paper that it is reported that there's this trophic cascade where um, the mid-Atlantic sharks will affect the cow nose rays, would affect the scallops population, but that's not true. Okay, basically he did his research and found that there are a lot of other factors that would affect um, the, different, the different levels of um, ecosystem in the oceans. It's not as simplified as that. 
Yeah, so um, my point of sharing this is because I realized that a lot of people depend on science and we like to believe in science, which is good. But we also need to understand that science can change. You know, research, new findings will refute certain things that were said earlier and we need to accept that and it's perfectly fine. We shouldn't just think that, oh, we, we always trust in a certain science that was talked about earlier before already and hold on to it forever. We need to allow for science to evolve and accept the new things that come up. Okay, so in case you're wondering what a cow nose ray look like, this is a video I found of a cow nose ray being born. Yes, Adam, I saw your hand up. Go ahead. Was this in the zoo? Uh, sadly, I was going to say that um, the video that I found was actually taken in an aquarium. And much as I don't believe in captivity, that was the only way I could find a video of a uh, ray being uh, given birth to. Yeah, so rays are really awesome. The moment they're, they're, they're birthed, they can swim immediately in the ocean already, and they look so cute. Yeah. So why am I talking about sharks and rays together? Because a fun fact about sharks and rays is that if you were to think about it biologically speaking, and if you were to simplify looking at sharks and rays, a ray is basically like a shark that is steamrolled. If you were to flatten a shark, that is exactly what it would look like. It would look like a ray. Yeah, that's why I talk about sharks and rays together. They belong to the same family, biologically speaking. Okay, so I guess I'm going to wrap up with this. Uh, I guess on this journey of mine, having learned so much from so many different stakeholders, such as scientists, governments, uh, fishermen, um, charity groups, I started to see that, hey, it wasn't just about sharks, right? We shouldn't just be talking about sharks, but about the whole ecosystem in the oceans. When we look at seafood, like what are we eating? What do you think you are eating? Okay, and why am I asking this question? Because back in 2010, 11, uh, there was this campaign that was very, very popular. I was a part of it too, actually, where we got to, where we went around asking people to say no to shark fin soup. Okay, and I, uh, over time, like right now, I'm at this point where I think back on this campaign and I wonder if it was really effective because you can tell people not to eat shark fin soup anymore. But um, a lot of the fishermen at that point would already be catching sharks. So they wouldn't want to, re they, they wouldn't be able to respond so quickly to the change. So one of the things that happened was that these fishermen continue to catch sharks, but then they sell the meat more than the fin. So they try to upsell the meat. They try to sell it as fish and the demand for shark meat started to grow instead of shark fin. So that was one of the problems that happened because of this campaign. Also, when I talk to people about this campaign and I ask them deeper questions, I ask them like, hey, okay, so you're sold off shark fin soup. Great, but do you think you're still eating shark meat? And then they will be like, uh, I, I don't know. I don't think so. So when they say that, I ask them, have you eaten this before? Do you all know what this is? It's a very popular, common local dish. It's a fish meat long. <laughs> I don't know if you all like it or eat it or anything. But basically, I'll ask them, so have you eaten fish meat long? And when they say yes, I would tell them that, yeah, actually, that is also shark meat. Okay, you can say that you've, eaten, you've stopped eating shark fin soup. But if you are still eating the other parts of the shark, or if you don't know that you're still eating shark meats, I think it doesn't really solve the problem in that sense. Even this as well, like a lot of people, uh, a lot of people love eating fish and chips, but actually a lot of um the best, the best type of the best type of meat for fish and chip is actually shark meat because it's easy to fillet and it's easy to fry so there's a lot of um especially the dogfish that's one of the most common species of sharks that is used for uh, fish and chips as a dish okay yeah so as i said uh even though people have stopped eating shark fin soup actually we're still um eat, uh, the demand for shark meat has been growing and I don't know if y'all saw this newspaper article that came out about a week ago, whereby it said that um, Singapore is still importing quite a fair number of shark fin. 
um, yeah, shark fin products. It's not, it, we are not necessarily, we haven't necessarily been solving the problem at all. We need to look at it holistically. It's not just about people saying no to eating shark fin soup. We need to think about the fishermen. We need to think about the merchants. We need to think about policies. We need to think about um, relationships between uh, countries as well. Yeah, so I guess I just wanted to wrap up with even more questions <laughs> for myself more, more than anything else. Uh, I, I've come to realize that there are some certain, that there are species of sharks that are biologically sustainable in the sense that they are not caught that, that often, so they can still reproduce easily enough and they are quite sustainable in the ocean. Not all sharks are depleted. Um, but I also started to wonder about fisheries management. Like I think in Southeast Asia, seafood is so cheap to the point where we overfish a lot of uh, different species of seafood and there isn't enough management. There's not, not enough science that is working alongside the, the fisheries in Southeast Asia to tell them that, hey, you should catch these sharks or, or these species of fish or you should not catch so many of this, or you should stop hunting for a certain period of time so that the, the fishers can, re, can uh, reproduce and get to a sustainable level again. Let them, give them a chance to regenerate. I think the shark meat problem is something that I started to think about more and raise and wedge fishes as well. And yeah, I, I've come to this point where um, I, I understand that it's not about banning anything or telling people to stop eating it it doesn't mean that doing these things would end the problem. Yeah, so I, I just want to appreciate the complexity of the issue of the shark fishing industry as I continue to plow on in the work. And yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll end up having a lot more questions along the way, but I want to appreciate the questions and hopefully we can work towards more collaboration as a community, as a whole, not just certain, certain sectors doing certain things, that, that without realizing that what they do affects everybody else in the chain as well. Okay, yeah, sorry, just one more video. So this is a video of a black tip reef shark that we see on the trips that we do. Uh, so when I bring people to Lombok, this is actually some of the things that we see on our trip to Lombok. Okay, yeah, so it looks like it's an aquarium, but it's not, it's the ocean, and this is where we, okay, not so much the ocean, uh, but like a, a shallower part of the ocean where I bring people to on the trips, and yeah, having, like, watching this video again really makes me miss going back to Lombok, which I can't do right now because of the pandemic. Yeah, but yeah, I guess I'll stop share here. Thank you so much for allowing me to share all those things that I've shared about my journey so far. Hi, Katie. I'm Carrie. I Hi. would like to ask, uh, mm, what happens if we, uh, how do we know whether the fish that we're eating uh, comes from shark? Because uh, it's so common and... Yeah, that's, thank you. That's a really, really good question. Because uh, as I talk to more and more people in Singapore, right, I realize that we don't really know what we're eating, right? A lot of the times we, it, the meat is already chopped up. We don't know if we're eating fish or shark or we, we basically don't really know what we're eating. And uh, I don't think I have an answer to your question because I feel like we, we for one, as consumers, we don't ask enough questions. And if we don't ask enough questions, it's very easy for, let's say, supermarkets uh, or fish merchants to not have to find the answers for us. But I feel like as consumers, if we were to probe and, and dig and ask more questions, and if we were to find out that, you know, we're eating shark or we're eating certain species that's getting depleted and overfished, if we can ask more questions, maybe that could be part of the change as well. Then we're putting pressure on the people who are responsible to take even more responsibility when they're selling what they're selling. I don't know if that answers your question because it, it's, it's, a very big <laughs> it's a very big step for many people to have to take. Thank you. So what about those uh, like frozen, uh, frozen products, fish products in the uh, supermarkets? Uh, yeah, they, 
usually that 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 will be fine, right? <laughs> fine. I don't know how to <laughs> don't know what fine uh, entails. Uh, okay, good question as well because uh, I can share a paper with you that some of my friends did. They actually went around collecting a lot of samples of different uh meats and shark. Uh, different meats and thin that they found being sold in supermarkets, in medical halls, in um, wherever they can buy, uh, wherever was labeled as shark. And they did DNA testing. And the results actually found, um, actually uh, suggested that there were quite a number of species of sharks that we can find in Singapore that are actually endangered sharks. But because the importation rules in Singapore are quite, I wouldn't say relaxed, they're just not very uh, differentiated. So let's say you want to import uh, some uh, certain uh, 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 shark meat. It doesn't, you don't need to label it as the species. It can just be labeled as shark meat. It's only after you do DNA testing, would you be able to know that, oh, this is actually this species of shark. So uh, yeah, again, I don't think I've answered your question. I, I just feel like a lot of frozen food gets hidden so much. Uh, it's so easy to hide things in frozen meats that we wouldn't know until we actually bring it to the, to the lab to test it for itself, what it is. Sorry, can I pipe up to that conversation? Yes. I hear that uh, you're saying that consumers should ask uh, the questions. But as you say, it's quite a complex situation where um, in this particular case, uh, I don't even know what government body there is that um, gives the guidelines to say what, what should be on the packaging. I think if, and I don't know how we can go about that as consumers, can we put pressure requests for such government bodies to say, hey, we, we actually do want to eat sustainable fish. Uh, can you make, you know, uh, labels uh, or, or certain, you know, certifications much more uh, obvious so that when we go into the supermarkets, we will only choose those marks. Because as a consumer, we, we can't go to those organizations and say, um, do that, right? So how can, what can we do really? Just what can we do? How can we... Um, put our voices together and request for these um, uh, uh, relevant uh, government bodies or uh, animal protection bodies uh, to, I don't know, give them a hand, to give them more, I don't know, uh, 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 power from the masses to make that a reality, I suppose. Thanks, Ellie. That's, that's a very, very good question as well. Um, I, I do resonate and agree that we should be reaching out to government bodies to tell them what we want as consumers. So I think as a start, uh, SFA, what does SFA stand for? Singapore Food Authority, I think. It used to be AVA, now it's SFA. SFA is a very uh, important channel to go to in order to tell them that, hey, you know, we, we are worried about what we're eating. We think that the labels are not enough. Um, yeah, start writing to them and telling them what, what you see and what you observe in the supermarkets and what you feel is lacking. And perhaps if more and more people started to talk about it and also, also wanted more labels to be more, um, to be more explicit, that, that might help. Yeah, I think it, it has to start somewhere. Like when people are not curious enough, then they don't care. Then they just buy whatever they want or rather they just buy whatever is available without asking questions. But if, if people started to ask more questions and started to request for uh, more information to be put out there, I think that would definitely help. Yeah. Okay, as a middle-class housewife, my biggest challenge is when I want to find out sustainable foods, they always come from very, very expensive sources. So I can't afford to buy sustainable food, you know? So, I mean, I would like to, but I don't because, yeah, I don't know how to get, get there. Yeah. Uh, I have no answer for that because I do agree with you too. I feel that, yeah, when you, when you put a certification to it, it kind of ups the price of the seafood and that is not very helpful in terms of managing inequality in Singapore or anywhere else in the world for that matter. So it's a, it's a bigger, more systemic problem that I don't have a solution for right now. <laughs> but it's a very good point and I think we need to yeah think about it a, a little bit deeper in terms of the interconnectedness of issues. Sometimes it's not just about saving uh, sharks, it's about everything is interconnected, like the inequality, the the... Yeah, everything, every social environmental issue is actually interconnected in that sense and it can be very complex. I think I saw uh, Helena had her hand up. Did you have a, did you have a question? Um, can sharks die naturally but not from age and human consumption? 
Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm sure they can die naturally if they're not if they're not hunted down. Uh, there are some marine protected areas and zones in the world where you cannot go into those areas to hunt for sharks. So that that can probably help them to live out their lives. Although the oceans are vast, so you can't really tell the shark to stay within the zone, right? They, if they want to swim somewhere else, they can. Yeah, and and that is a real that is a real thing. So I was listening to this shark scientist from Florida recent a few weeks a few days ago, and he was talking about his research on uh, tiger sharks in Florida, and he was talking about how because of climate change the waters were warming, and a lot of these tiger sharks were starting to swim further up north. So where they were before was a marine protected zone because the scientists had put in their recommendations. They did the research and they said that, okay, this is a zone, this is a no fishing zone because we can see a lot of tiger, tiger sharks here. But as climate, as the waters warm, as climate change and the waters warm, these tigers, these tiger sharks started to swim towards fishing zones up north. So policy, I, I don't, I don't know if the science and the policy can catch up fast enough, but they really need time to do the research be before they can propose. But yes, that was one problem that happened. Oh, and another question. Uh, do sharks have a natural predator? Uh, okay, that's a great question. And I can't give you a straight answer for that because there are like 500 over different species of sharks. So some sharks are bigger than others. So like the coral cat shark that we saw in the video that I showed you earlier, they are a bit smaller. So yes, they do have predators, which are the bigger sharks most likely. Uh, but if you are talking about bigger sharks, such as whale sharks and tiger sharks, most of the time they are at the top of the food chain already. So they don't really have yeah that many predators except for maybe bigger whales. Yeah. Okay. So Thank humans you. are the biggest predators. <laughs> Yeah, I have one question. So mm -hmm. I was asking, uh, based on your observations or research, how has COVID affected the environment and mm -hmm. tourism? Oh, wow. That's, uh, again, a very complex question. Okay, so for one, uh, because I run an ecotourism business, I definitely am affected in the sense that I haven't run any trips for the last almost two years now. And uh, I have been checking in on the fishermen. Uh, I have been trying to pay them still, even though I haven't been able to bring people on the trips because I feel bad about things. Uh, but the, the reality is that the situation there is pretty bad. And the, the sharks that they are catching, the other fishermen that are, uh, that are not working with me, the sharks that they are catching are also fetching lower prices at this point in time. I, I don't know why. Uh, I need to probe a little bit more about that, but there are definitely effects that are happening and I'm still trying to find out more. So I, I have been going back to the fishing ports as well. And I'm also trying to find out how our Singapore merchants are also affected by the COVID and how uh, the COVID situation and how the prices of, of uh, fish meat and shark has also been affecting them. So I don't have a complete answer yet, but I know that there are negative effects so far from, from based on my observations so far. Oh, Elisha asks, what is your favorite shark? Oh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> I would say um, hammerhead sharks and any type of hammerhead shark because there's so many different types. There's the bonnet head uh, hammerhead shark and there's the great hammerhead. But I really like hammerhead sharks because they look so weird, right? In a sense, they look so different. And I, I, I hope to be able to see them while diving. I haven't been able to see them yet. Sorry, Kathy, I missed like the front of your presentation. Perhaps you had an introduction then, but you are saying, for example, you've spe been speaking to uh, even the merchants in Singapore about how COVID has affected the business. And under what identity do you assume? Do you assume um, the owner of an ecotourism business or under, I think you were saying that you work with, I can't, sorry, I wasn't really paying attention. So who do you say you are? Because I'm not sure, like, mm -hmm. how do you Okay, since if you just say, hey, I'm a... <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Yeah, so uh, because I've been going to the fishing ports for a few years now, since 2017, so the, the merchants know me know me and my partner very well already. But I guess when we first went down, we, we just assumed the identity of independent researcher who are just very curious about sharks and rays. Yeah, and that works, I guess. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Vivian, about the diseases, uh, marine accidents with boats. Uh, I didn't get the complete picture. Was there a question to that? Oh, no. Basically, you, uh, I, I think it was in response to the question of, you know, if if, there, if humans stop hunting for sharks, then what, what will happen to them? But 
because other than old age, they could could they die of like diseases oh. or accidents with yeah for sure with, uh, like you know the boats and things. Yeah. Because I know when we go diving, we 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 usually hear a lot of uh, stories about. Um, you know the the bigger fish being being hurt by by the propellers, uh, and, yeah. and yeah, even though they are not supposed to hunt the particular species, but because of that, then that's how they uh, that's how they end up uh, dying. Yeah. That's true, and a very good point. I think we do a lot. Of, we try to protect them as best we can, but there are a lot of uh, unintended consequences that happens as well because of the way humans live. What the, what do you do pre- prior to uh, starting the dorsal effect? Like, were oh. you a researcher or were you a scientist? That's how you kind of like got involved in all this. Okay, sorry, I wasn't clear to, I, I, yeah, I, I missed that out. Good question. Uh, so I was a secondary school teacher. I was teaching things that were very different from what I'm doing right now. So I, I was teaching history and um, English language. I guess I only got interested in sharks after those two encounters that I shared about uh, wild diving and snorkeling with sharks. And after I watched a few more documentaries about sharks, I just got more and more interested. So no, I don't have a background in marine biology. It was just something that I, I grew to love and, and learn along the way so far. That's pretty cool, actually. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, you know, it's really, you know, based on the interest and the role that interest. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Dawn has a question. What do children need to know if they want to do what you do or which part of do what I do (laughs) well uh, how about ecotourism and also like um, let's just say if they want to do something similar to the dorsal effect what what should they do Hmm. thank you Um, I guess I would say you don't have to do something similar to the dorsal effect what led me to, to starting the dorsal effect was really I guess primarily a love for sharks Although I agree that passion alone cannot get us very far, but it got me started. So because I love sharks, I wanted to see if there was a way I could get pe- I could get fishermen to make another way of li- of uh, making money instead of hunting sharks. So I tried to talk to them and I tried to propose something else that they proposed together with me as well. So in a sense, when you love something enough keep on pursuing it and keep on chasing after it and you may be able to find doors opening or you may be able to find opportunities happening or you may be able to see opportunities for yourself that you can create just because you love it enough to want to dig dig a lot deeper into it. I think it's amazing. You're such an inspiration. It's like... (laughs) I mean, I I mean, I I assume that some of us must have heard all this before, right? Like, don't eat shark's fin, or like sharks are depleting, or like, you know, um, we we should we should know what we're eating. But I think very few would actually get up our backsides and do something about it, you know. Okay. And you are really just going through all the paces just because you have that goal and you've decided, you know. I'm just going to try. I'm going to talk to all the different sorts of people, even though you said you don't have a background. What an inspiration. I think we should take a lot from that. Just like one person, you could do so much, right? Thanks, Nelly. Uh, I, I hum- humbled by you saying that. But at the same time, also, I guess, as I talk to more people and I realize how complex and big this problem is it can also be a bit depressing <laughs> along the way <laughs> just to share as well I, I also like to ask something a bit more practical like um I mean it's something that does not guarantee you kind of like a, a great income I mean it's a lot of passion then what helps you keep you afloat like you know for daily expenses and all that I guess I, I'm sure that ecotourism business brings in uh income but and definitely, I believe you are quite affected at this point because of the tourism issues. But what are your planning when you when you dived into this, or was there support that you, um, practical financial support? I guess because then you also need to feed yourself or your family if you need to. Yeah. yeah. How did that work out for you? Okay, so I guess when I first started the dance, in fact. I was very naive. Like, I had some savings, yes. Uh, I didn't know whether it was enough or not. I didn't do my calculations. At some point, I ran out of money and I really got really scared. So that is a very good question that you've asked. Always plan ahead if you can. I didn't and I was very naive. But I guess I got lucky in the sense that after one year of trying to take off the dorsal effect, uh, some of my 
so, uh, or rather one of my friends actually reached out to me and like, hey, can you give a talk at my polytechnic? And I did. And after that, he was, he talked, he chatted with me a little bit more and he found out that I was struggling. And then he was like, why don't you be, why don't you come and uh, be a part-time lecturer in polytechnic? It, it, it gives you a lot of flexibility of time and it can help you pay the bills at the same time as well. So that has what, that's what I've been doing in the sense that uh, it, it, uh, it's it's a good thing to do on the site because I can pay the bills for one and for another the breaks are long enough for me to take people on trips still with the dorsal effect but of course the last two years uh, in a sense the dorsal effect hasn't had any trips so it was basically just me lecturing and doing the work at the fishery ports uh. yeah what do you think might be happening this year then on your radar um yeah it's a great question like i said <laughs> earlier i'm not a planner and i don't not really someone who looks ahead uh but um yeah i guess with the dorsal effect i'm really it's kind of really just like a waiting game to see if we can still travel if we can bring people back i do understand that it is yeah i mean i do understand that right now it's just really difficult and a lot of variants are coming up so travels near impossible but at the same time also i kind of appreciate that the 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 fact that we can't travel so much because then it, it helped to reduce carbon footprint and perhaps maybe after this pandemic people might start to rethink the way they travel like should we travel because just because we need to meet a quota or should we travel because we need that break and we want to and we want that that trip to be a bit more meaningful in a sense that we do more responsible sustainable things so I do hope that you know travel can resume, but in a more in a in a more compassionate, responsible, sustainable way. Uh, because that is not something that I can that I have control over. Uh, another thing that I hope to work on is so for the last two years, I was actually doing my master's part time in um, science communication, and uh, I was trying to find out. So for my dissertation, I was trying to find out more about sambal stingray consumption in Singapore. Because we saw many species, we saw a particular species of race a lot at the fishing ports. Like there's this one species of race that were always caught. And then in 2020, it was recently found to be endangered, listed, uplisted as endangered. So for my dissertation, I wanted to focus on that to, to find out more about uh, people eating sambal stingray. Why do they like to eat sambal stingray in Singapore? Do they know about the species of stingray that they eat in Singapore? And with that paper that I just completed, I guess I kind of hope to be able to work a bit closer with NPARCs to implement the recommendations. But it's a bit ambitious because all the recommendations are huge. It's like, you know, it involves inter-country uh, uh, inter um, relationships and getting them to do certain things. Yeah, but okay, it's ambitious, but I still want to be able to take steps towards it. <laughs>